for me who was fourteen. I listing off the good resources. Annie, so her last name starts with B E A. Yeah, she's brand new. Uh, she used to replace Rebecca. I have five people now. Yeah. I have eight positions. It drives me crazy, yeah. and they still don't have a clerkship person. Which means Will is still doing clerkship stuff. I didn't realize that Ashley actually knew me by then. Apparently, I have become famous in just a few weeks. I'm at events. <laughs> Not going to any appointments except for the appointment. And yet, they all know me by then. It's the only guy. So, um, like, they go to the other stuff? They're supposed to. They're also supposed to do some events. The problem is, by people taking care of a job that has eight positions. Actually, they have four people taking care of a job that had eight. So, Will was one of the main. Good evening. Yeah. And welcome. Uh, so, I want to welcome you to our intellectual property at the Supreme Court series uh, here at American University Washington College of Law. My name is Sean Flynn. I'm the director of our program on information justice and intellectual property. And on the afternoon following every intellectual property argument at the Supreme Court, we hold this event. Um, usually at 5 p.m., usually in this same room, um, but always webcast. So part of our audience is um, online today, so we'll be addressing um, both them and the live audience. And the webcast, for those that would like to see it later, will be available on demand as well. It's all available at our website, which is www.pidgip.org. That's P-I-J-I-P.org. And that has a link to our YouTube channel where this will be displayed. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, so if you are uh, tweeting today, um, the hashtag that we use for this series is, um, is hashtag IP at SCOTUS, and you can also tag um, Pidgip's account, which is at WCL underscore Pidgip. Um, and if you're online, if you have questions for the audience, um, you can tweet them to that account, and I will try to bring them into our discussion. Um, so the case this, this this morning was Romag Fasteners Incorporated versus Fossil Incorporated. And the case raises the question of whether willfulness is a requirement for the disgorgement of profits of a trademark infringer under the Lanham Act. The main provisions, oops, that's the, there. The main provisions uh, of the Lanham Act that this case was revolving around is on the screens. Um, above and for the uh, purposes of people online, the operative language is that when a violation of any right of the registrant of a mark registered in the PTO um, is uh, subject to a violation under Section 43A or D, which is the general infringement clauses of trademark under the Lanham Act, or a willful violation under Section 43C, which is the dilution cause of action, shall have been established in any civil action. The plaintiff shall be entitled, subject to the provisions of Section 2932, and subject to the principles of equity, entitled to recover, one, defendant's profits, two, any damages, and three, the cost of the action. And so the question in this case is whether that clause um, subject to the provisions of equity permit a plaintiff to recover disgorgement of profits even if that particular infringement is not willful. Uh, so to discuss this question and what we heard at the arguments today and what was briefed in the, in the papers before the court, we have a panel of, of various trademark experts who have either participated in the case or have been following it. So immediately um, to my left, your right, is Christine Haight-Farley, a professor here who teaches um, trademark, has our trademark law program um, here at American University. Um, to her left, your right, is Dean, is it Ayler? Eiler. Eiler, um, who uh, represented 
uh, the American Intellectual Property Law Association in its amicus brief before the court, and he's a partner at Lathrop uh, GPM uh, and represents uh, trademark and unfair competition clients. And to his left, your right, is Jacqueline Lesser, who is a counsel at Baker Hostetler and teaches copyright law at Drexler University and is also a trademark litigator. And to her left, your right, finally, is um, David Donahue, who is a counsel on the INTA brief, so the International Trademark Association, and is a partner at Frost, Zelnick, Lerman, and Zissou, and is also a trademark litigator. So we have um, four trademark experts to discuss this case. Three of us were at the hearing this morning, the first, the first three and, and myself included. Um, and David has already uh, uh, read some of, at least, <laughs> the, the transcripts and, and has um, perhaps even some questions you know, for the rest of us that were at the hearing. Um, so the schedule for um, this session is that first we'll focus on kind of the facts of this case in particular and the context of trademark litigation about why this question arise. How do, how do, how do, how do remedies work in trademark litigation? Um, and then we'll advance to the particular legal arguments in this case and what the, um, the questions and answers and arguments were made before the court. And then we'll save a little bit of time in to prognosticate a little bit on um, where we think the judges were indicating that they might be moving, count noses, and try to think about the future a little bit. Um, so let's start with the, the factual issue first. I mean, so the basic facts, um, as I understand them, um, was that... Um, the, uh, that Fossil, uh, Fossil Incorporated is the maker of handbags. Ah, uh, well, good point. So Fossil owns the trademarks and the maker of the handbags resides in China. So it's a Chinese manufacturer. And uh, Romag um, sells patented and trademark uh, magnetic snap fasteners <laughs> that fasten the pieces of the bag together, which are also made in China. And so on, under an agreement between the two um, that uh, Fossil was, that Fossil's uh, Chinese agent was selling uh, or was buying the uh, patented snap fasteners from Romag's licensee um, and was supposed to be incorporating that product onto the final bags. But at some point along the process, the, um, the distributor of the uh, that Fossil's agent essentially started buying the fasteners from a different Chinese company that was making counterfeit uh, fasteners. And that went on for approximately a year. Apparently about 600,000 bags were sold with this counterfeit mark before it was discovered. <laughs> Litigation ensues. There's both a patent and a trademark on Romag's fastener. The, the, both were adjudicated, uh, well, both were litigated and, uh, and, and that Fossil was found to be violating both the trademark and the patent rights. The patent remedy was essentially a reasonable royalty, and I think it was a relatively low sum, of some, somewhere around $100,000, something like that, um, was the damages for the patent side. But the trademark side is the part that keeps being litigated, because there, there was this opportunity to seek disgorgement of profits, and the ultimate sum there was, was much larger. Um, so let's... Um, Start there. This case is ultimately about damages and whether disgorgement of profits are available. But let me turn to the panel to kind of fill in other key aspects of the facts um, in this case that we need to understand um, to kind of understand what's going forward. And I t Dean and I talked on the courthouse steps a little bit, and he agreed to go back and read the record a little further um, so that we could piece together the damages. But so tell us what the uh, what the courts did below. Yeah. So the issue is whether. Uh, Several of the things that, oh, I thought that was on, thank you. Uh, several of the things that happened at the district court that I think are really important to understand the complexity of the case, uh, that could be important going forward in the case and to kind of understand what was happening. So the, the trial court um, in Connecticut, so it was a second circuit case, there's a patent involved, so the, on appeal they go to the federal circuit as opposed to the second circuit, but the, the trial that happens in the district of Connecticut, there's a, both a jury trial and a bench trial. And the jury makes some advisory findings that are interesting to kind of think about as you, as you try to process what is happening in the, in the ultimate question here. Um, 
So among other things, the jury made an advisory award of $90,000 of Fossil's profits for trademark infringement under an unjust enrichment theory. And they made an, a separate advisory award of $6.7 million of Fossil's profits for trademark infringement under a deterrence theory. And the plaintiff's brief makes clear that in order to make the advisory award uh, for those deterrence-based uh, profits or the award based on deterrence, they had to find callous disregard. So not willfulness, but they had to find callous disregard regard in order to, to recommend that $6.7 million uh, accounting award. Um, they separately found no willfulness, so they found callous disregard, but found that the infringement was not willful, and then they found that 99% of Fossil's profits were attributable to factors other than its infringement of the Romag mark. So there's some findings that, that kind of are in conflict with each other, at least a bit. Um, most importantly for, as the case gets presented here, the question of willfulness versus other findings that they made. So once there was a finding of no willfulness, the district court held that uh, either of the accounting-based, uh, profits-based awards could not be uh, actually awarded. So these advisory uh, findings the jury made for $90,000 on, on, on just enrichment theory and $6.7 million, that's really probably what the plaintiff's trying to get here. That's why the, uh, what they're after in the case. And the district court said um, in post-trial uh, motion ruling, because the jury found uh, no willfulness, even though they made some other findings like callous disregard, uh, no willfulness <laughs> equals no uh, accounting. And so applied that Second Circuit law um, uh, on this, this key issue in the case, and, meaning if there's no willfulness, you can't get an accounting, period, full stop. We're not going to look at the other equitable factors uh, that might warranted or, or might not, uh, and then um, refuse to allow any of those uh, accounting-based uh, or profits-based uh, awards. Great. Now, so let me ask us to kind of, you know, step up a little bit and look at trademark litigation more generally. One of the arguments that we heard raised today was that one of the reasons we need, you know, this kind of accounting of profits is so difficult to prove damages either in this particular case or in these kind of cases in general. Um, can you say a little more about that? Maybe, maybe Professor Farley, you know, what are some of the remedies that are available in trademark cases and, and how important, important is, you know, this question within that overall? Okay. Remind me of your question because I'm not going to answer it right away. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I do want to step the back a little bit. always is answer whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to step back a little bit and, and, and look a little bit from more of a distance about, yeah. about this, um, this case as an exemplar of these issues of um, remedies in trademark cases. So uh, yesterday, the Supreme Court uh, heard a case involving a, a trademark dispute that had been litigated for uh, over the past 19 years. This one has only been litigated nine years. So it's a relatively short period of litigation. <laughs> in that period of litigation, it's gone up to the Second Circuit twice, back to the district court up to the uh, Supreme Court twice. The Supreme Court granted cert um, and then um, uh, vacated and remanded as a result of a, a patent case that it had recently decided. So that's a lot of intense litigation, which is obviously um, resource intensive. Um, the plaintiff in the case who, who you talked about what they do um, and how they do it, the plaintiff in the case is a small family owned company. Um, so when you think about just the kind of economics of enforcing um, these intellectual property rights and you know, it, you know, differently situated parties, um, that's a lot. Um, the other little background piece, just to, to fill out the, the picture a little bit more, is that this little family-owned business um, has three times gone to court um, seeking uh, a remedy against an infringer uh, uh, on the eve of Black Friday. <laughs> so that's an interesting strategy, right? Days before Black Friday, on three separate occasions, um, saw an injunction um, when they found instances of counterfeit Romag snaps on the market. Um, and so that was, that was that issue in the lower court litigation. So um, 
I always apologize to my students when I teach trademark law because we spend one day and it's the last day of class um, talking about remedies. And I think a lot of trademark litigators would think that is entirely wrong, that we should probably start with remedies, right? Because um, that is a major indication of what to do, right? Um, whether, whether to take the client and what to do with the client. Um, so, um, so I've done it wrong. I failed my students. Um, but um, we tend to think that in trademark law generally, um, the, the, the main remedy is an injunction, right? This is a little bit uh, different from other areas of law where generally um, we're trying to um, prevent consumer confusion. So we want to you know, stop the infringement and um, we want to protect the trademark owner's reputation. Um, so those don't generally involve monetary damages. Of course, there have always been monetary damages involved. And I think what makes this case difficult is that we have um, previous statutes. Um, there was mention in the briefs and in the argument today of the 1905 statute. We have the statute um, that exists today that was um, effective in 1947. And we have amendments of that statute since then. And all the while, we have common law of courts on the ground trying to figure out what is an equitable monetary award. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what the loss for the plaintiff is, and that seems inadequate. Um, and so there are lots of references, um, especially in the case law, but also in the statute, to principles of equity and court's discretion to change that, that award um, up to treble damages. You know, um, I, I think if I looked at it, there would be numerous instances um, where the statute gives a court discretion to manage that. And I think that is where we have these issues um, that, that brought us to this statutory provision that you read. Um, so let me let me follow Christine's lead and ask you a very open-ended question. Other aspects <laughs> <laughs> of the facts of this case or the context of trademark litigation that you think are, are useful to understand before we get into the legal issues of the exact case. But so, uh, Jacqueline, you want well, to well, I think there are a couple of things that I think were raised a little bit. bit. Um, Professor Farley, you mentioned that Fossil is a licensor. Mm. They're not the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And I think when we talk about trademark cases, we tend to look at it as though you've got the trademark owner who's making something. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of Romac. They're a family-owned business, but they don't have a factory in their backyard. They probably did a long time ago. But they also have contracted out their manufacturing. So there is a third party in China that is making their, their goods. And they also have a contractual relationship with Fossil, some kind of a supply relationship that would track you know, the, the fasteners that are being put in the bags. So there, there's a number of different agreements. So it's not, just a, it's, it's not just you're, OK, you're ripping me off, and you're a separate company. But there's, there's also, I think, an important fact that isn't discussed that there's a contract here and that you're buying our widgets and there should be some kind of a way to be able to show that we are being damaged that you know we have a balance sheet and that balance sheet shows that we haven't you know we haven't profited on the sale of our, our fasteners for quite a long time for a year how did that happen you know and there's usually there are usually in, in any contracts there are you know there, there's you're entitled to an accounting you're entitled to certain things what struck at, struck me was during at least when i looked at the docket there were lots of motions to compel in discovery for da damaged questions and that romag refused to produce any any um, discovery on their own damages, which considering that there is a contract in place, you would think that it would be available. And their point was that they had already elected for profit, that they were going to seek an accounting of profits. But when I look at that, and I look at the question of you know, willfulness, and I look at the issue of a windfall, I'm struck by that, um, that you know, why not produce that? Um, that discovery. Discovery is fairly broad. And this is a situation where there are a number of contracts involved, and you should be able to track that. 
And then when I look at it in terms of the fact that at least what I read of the, the case and the, the, um, the court's orders there, you know, that there was a delay in actually seeking an injunction, that it wasn't only that they waited until Black Friday, but that they knew about this in May. Mm -hmm. So that there was a significant period of time when they could have taken action and they didn't. And that seemed coupled with the fact that they, you know, that they would not produce any evidence of their damages or anything uh, that, you know, is this a situation where they were looking for a windfall? Um, and is that something that the court would look at anyway, regardless of whether or not, you know, you have as a gatekeeping matter in the Second Circuit, uh, you know, willfulness uh, before you look at um, a disgorgement of profits? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was the point of one of the points of uh, Inta's brief and AIPLA's brief as well uh, was that all of that could be taken into account and should be taken into account. Uh, but none of that would be taken into account if the court sticks to this hard and fast rule that willfulness is a prerequisite. In other words, it may well be on remand that for various reasons, including the lack of willfulness, that Romag should not get a profit award. But the, 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 the issue is really, you know, cutting it off right at the start and saying no, no willfulness, no profits. And, and going back to your earlier question about trademark remedies in general, uh, as, a, as a, a litigator in the field, I can tell you that we often talk to clients right at the beginning and say, yeah, you have a good case here, but there's a chance that you'll wind up with nothing. And, and, and the client says, well, how can that be? And we say, well, uh, in, in the circuit that we're in, um, in a particular case, this circuit has very clearly said you need to show actual confusion to get damages. Uh, you can't argue, like in a Romag situation, you can't just point to the fact that, well, they saved money by buying, they didn't buy my widgets, they bought somebody else's widgets, therefore I should get the money that I would have received if they had bought my widgets. It doesn't work that way. In, in the second circuit, at least, you need to prove actual confusion <laughs> Uh, that consumers were actually confused before you can even get to damages. Um, you, maybe you can get there by producing a survey showing actual confusion. But and, and get going back for a second, how do you prove actual confusion? You know, consumer testimonials saying, "I thought I was buying your widget, but I was I actually bought somebody else's." But that's really rare, very difficult evidence to get. Uh, people don't, you know. It, usually people, when people buy something, especially low cost impulse purchases and find out that they were duped, they, they throw it away and, and, and maybe never buy your good, the genuine goods again, because now they can't trust that, the good, that goods under this brand are legitimate. Or maybe they go onto social media and, and post something, but that's not necessarily gonna be evidence you can use in court. So the evidence is very difficult. Then you can get a survey. Surveys are very expensive. The other side's going to hire their own expert. They're going to take shots at the survey. Maybe the survey can can prove uh, actual confusion. Maybe maybe not. But so so say you can't get damages. It used to be certainly when I started practicing that if you were a trademark uh, plaintiff and you won on likelihood of confusion, you proved all the elements. You said okay, there's a likelihood of confusion. Jury or judge finds that you would get an injunction, permanent injunction, because the irreparable harm would be presumed from the likelihood of confusion, which makes sense. If, the, if there's a likelihood that consumers thinking they're purchasing your goods are actually going to, who, who think that you're, they're purchasing your goods wind up with somebody else's goods, that's going to harm you because you no longer have control of your reputation. But after the Supreme Court's decision in eBay versus Merck Exchange, which that was that that case, and then Winter versus uh, National Resource Defense Fund or League. Uh, those two cases combined threw throughout in a patent context, and then in a preliminary injunction context, the idea of a presumption of an irreparable harm. <coughs> and several <coughs> circuits have followed that in trademark cases, finding that you can no longer <coughs> presume irreparable harm uh, based on based on a likelihood of confusion. So. You now have to have expert testimony or, or other, you know, going back again, you have to prove actual confusion or you have to have expert testimony 
on, a, on, on how, why you'll be irreparably harmed. But there's no guarantee anymore that, uh, that you'll get an injunction even if you win. And we were involved in a case, we were representing the defendant, so I should be happy with the result, but uh, there was a jury trial. Plaintiff won, the jury held that our client infringed, uh, but uh, the, there was no actual confusion, so there were no damages. The court didn't award, award profits because there was no willfulness, and the court did not award an injunction, again, on the theory that because there was no actual confusion and no willfulness, there was no likelihood of irreparable harm. So the, def the plaintiff won, but got nothing. So that's one of the animating concerns here is that trademark infringement should not be, you should have a, a remedy for a wrong. And the remedy shouldn't just be a, a jury verdict and a, a you know, pat on the back. There should be something that a trade, successful trademark plaintiff can walk away with. So, so thank you for all that. And now let's <clears throat> shift a little bit into the law and the, and the question in this case. And, and uh, Christine, I wanna turn to you next if I can. But so explain to us how we get um, from that kind of description of the various remedies available to the interpretation of this per specific part of the statute, which is not the injunction part, it's the damages and profits part. Um, and the only mention of willful is about a violation of 43C, which is the dilution standard. Mm -hmm. So why is it an issue in this case? And even David took it for granted, well, you can't get dam you can't get profits if it's not willful. Where does that piece of the law come? Why isn't this a slam dunk easy mm -hmm. statutory interpretation case? Mm -hmm. I think that's what um, most of the questions were about today. Most <laughs> most of the discussion was focused on that. You know, where where, where is wolf, willful? How is it there? And um, so Romag, the petitioner, said it isn't, um, and it's glaringly absent when you look at um, that provision that you've read because it is willful. Um, for profits in dilution, and the absence for infringement should mean that willful standard is, is not re required. Um, what uh, Fossil says is um, that's a very dangerous statutory interpretation because this was a 1999 amendment. It was um, not announced by Congress as changing an existing standard, and it would conflict with um, then existing uh, case law, um, and in fact, the proper uh, statutory interpretation is to um, assume that Congress was aware of the existing standard, and if it was silent, it meant to um, be consistent with that standard. Um, so, what what could have looked like a you know in, in another um, in another timeline of statutory writing could have looked like an easy. Um, statutory argument for a willful, uh, the lack of a willful standard becomes more complicated. And so on the other side, Fossil argued that um, willfulness um, is uh, just completely solid in case law, completely solid. Ba basically what uh, uh, Fossil argued was that we have 200 years of consistent case law, both in this country and in the UK, right? Um, and, um, and that particular word willful dropped into um, uh, section 35 is a result of catching the statute up to the inclusion of dilution in the act in 1996. And although willfulness was used in the section adding the dilution cause of action, um, it was never carried over into the provision on remedies in section 35, and that's all it was meant to do, which is also a reasonable statutory interpretation argument. Uh, did that answer the question? I have a lot more to I say, but so. I want to. So Jacqueline, <laughs> let me, since, since uh, you also didn't file a brief necessarily on the, on the, uh, the side of Romag, um, can you support that argument a little more? Like where's the textual hook in, in uh, 117 that allows us to bring in what what Professor Farley was talking about this, you know, many, many years. I think uh, I think Kaitel said, you know, two hundred years of case law. Why is that relevant? What's how do we bring the case law into the statute? I, I think the the just the the use of the the word equity has always meant something, and um, judges have interpreted that looking at restatement of judgments and uh, 
as, as meaning something that requires a degree of culpability and it's just specifically willfulness. So that, that by using the word equity, that would necessarily imply willfulness. But the question is whether or not that requires something that's sort of a, you know, sort of a, just a, a gate um, there. And that's how it was initially interpreted in the, in the George Bash case in the 1960s, that that would necessarily mean, and, and, and from that point in time, you know, which is much more modern than obviously 200 years, you know, that, that's been sort of a traditional interpretation of it based on just you know, that, the law of equity. Um, and so, and, and it was only um, with uh, the amendments to the Lanham Act relating to dilution that courts and district courts, even in the Second Circuit, started looking at that as, well, that must mean, since no one added the word um, the word willfulness here in every single place, that must mean that we no longer need it. And so there are district court decisions, even in the Second Circuit, that have taken that out. So, the, so it's um, uh, Rogan's position so the, the statute says the plaintiff shall be entitled subject to the provisions of equity. And then um, uh, Fossil's counsel, sorry, argued that, well, for 200 years, he said, there's been no case in which through essentially federal common law, even to the pre-Lanham Act era, and this statute's been amended several times since. And in none of those cases has there ever been a, a ruling for disgorgement of profits without finding of willfulness. Therefore, Congress, subject to the provisions of equity, meant to basically codify that common law, was legislating against the background of that common law. And therefore, it was not changing the rule, and the rule has always been, and is now, that you have to have a willfulness requirement for disgorgement of profits, right? So that's again, that sounded like the strong version. I think Neil Keitel mentioned there's five trademark treatises, and all of them say the same thing. Even the AIPLA you know, lawyer here who's against this position mentioned, well, we counsel our clients that <laughs> you can't get disgorgement if there's no willfulness. Well, that's because that's because I, I, I work in the Second Circuit. <laughs> oh, and, and so, so, and under the George Bash rule. But but to, to your point, uh, and it's, it's interesting that neither of the parties actually briefed how do principles of equity get into this section of the Lanham sure. Act. Yeah. We did address it in, in, in our brief, in INTA's brief, the International yeah. Trademark Association, and it was from, and this is a nod to the three professors on the panel here, it was due to a letter to Representative Latham from a professor, uh, Mil Milton Handler of, uh, of uh, Columbia Law School. And this, this goes to your point. He, he said in his letter that uh, he talks about how the, the section of the Latham Act talking about damages and profits. He says, in view of the language of, uh, of Section 35, which at the time was the injunction statute, that sections 35 and 36 are derived in the main from the present act, the 1905 act, it seems clear that the normal principles of equity in respect of allowance of and defenses to an accounting of profits and the recovery of damages are not affected by this bill. So, and then, and they took that and said, okay, we'll, we'll add in principles of equity. The language wasn't there until he suggested that. And so the, that goes to the point that the intention was in putting in principles of equity in, in section 35, the idea was, I'm sorry, section 30, 37? In any event, the idea was we're, we're just keeping the status quo. Whatever courts have considered to this point in time in determining whether to award profits and also to award damages, that, that that's not affected by the language of this act. What, what, so what's at issue is, you know, and what the big dispute was today is well, what was there? Two hundred years of uh, yeah. of clear precedent, <laughs> and uh, in in Romag's brief, I, I can't remember if it was the reply, the rebuttal brief, or the your original brief. Lisa Blatt refers to uh, the the case law as a hot mess. <laughs> yeah, the first time I've ever seen that description in a Supreme Court brief. But any in any event, her her argument was Romag's argument was it's not clear at all. There's two hundred years of law all over the place where where Neil Cott yelled obviously took a different position, um, saying that it was crystal clear and consistent over 200 years. Yeah, Dean, follow up. So give, give, the, counter, give the counter argument. So what's the strong version of Romag's argument that, that Keitel's getting up wrong and um, 
you know, here's how we should really interpret the statute. Yeah, I think the strongest version of that would be something like um, the presentation that he made far exceeds the uh, actual clarity in the law. Um, I think he, had, he made a very strong argument as if it was crystal clear and could, read, could be read by a rational person only one way. And I think that uh, looking at the case law and uh, some of the questions from the justices about sort of ancillary questions also show that it's really not that clear. And so uh, principles of equity, the argument on, on the Romag side, or perhaps the argument like we made and like Inta made that wasn't really in behalf of each either party, but really just the argument that it, it shouldn't be, a, a willfulness shouldn't be absolutely required, um, in part says there just isn't that clarity. There, there are cases that have looked at a lot of different factors uh, in inequity, and they do look at willfulness, and they do look at all kinds of descriptions of intent, um, among other factors, uh, but that it's more complex than that. And that so the history and even some of the cases they're citing, um, I think don't quite get as far as the argument that was made suggests that they do. Um, they, they certainly talk about intent, and they probably don't award in most instances, and I haven't studied every case from the 1800s and, um, that they cited, but um, I'm fairly confident that, that most of those cases um, didn't make an award of profits without a discussion of intent. But to make the, the stronger award, you have to conflate any discussion of intent with willfulness. And so I think that the, the argument pushing back is essentially it's not that clear uh, that the principles of equity really are meant to be as broad as possible and to do what equity does, to look at not have these hard and fast rules, but rather to examine all the possible factors. And that's kind of what we do in equity, whether it's in trademark law or in, in other areas. And we cited in our brief some things outside of, of trademark law that would be very consistent with that. And so if you have that history... I mean, basically, if the court believes that the, the history is more complex than, than the respondent argued, they're going to win. Um, because if, if, if there isn't this 200 years of absolute clarity, then either Congress wasn't legislating with that backdrop or Congress didn't bring that alleged clarity in with, with the principles of equity language. And then we're back to um, where... Many of us also argued in terms of what what should happen, I meaning not only what happened, what it, what is sort of the the case will look like going backward, but isn't it a better thing for courts to have the full range of discretion uh, in order to to do justice, to do equity going forward? So so maybe now we can start bringing the judges into the conversation a little bit, the justices, excuse me, into the conversation a little bit, um, and start you know uh, uh, playing with some of their questions and what they seem to be going at in relation to counsel. And I'd actually like to start with Gorsuch. So it was actually an incredibly hot bench, I thought, for an IP case today. I wasn't expecting it after the uh, first case was about whether Chris Christie's people had, need to go to jail for shutting down the Washington Bridge. Um, but but so um, almost all, I think maybe everybody except for Thomas might have asked a question. Mm -hmm. today. Yep. Trying to think, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Gorsuch, Gorsuch's question was like, why should we care about any of this? That you know, isn't the right way to read subject to the principles of equity mean subject to principles like latches and things like that that might reduce damages, but essentially in every case you would have profits and damages and costs would be essentially available subject to principles of equity. That doesn't mean, essentially he was saying, incorporating all of this case law around what are the different factors of equity. That's not what it was trying to incorporate. It just meant subject to these kind of principles that might reduce damages. Can I address that? Yeah. that? So yeah, I think that uh, you're right that Gorsuch asked a question to that effect, yeah. but I think that almost every justice asked a question to that effect. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I think you know. I think Breyer definitely. Every one of his questions was mm. to that effect. Like why? Why does this matter? Why do you <laughs> need this rule or that rule? These these. Why are we having this fight? Doesn't matter. Um, Justice Kavanaugh, in particular, said uh, he he used Neil Katyal's phrase, um, "Not worth the candle." What's that phrase? Um, yeah. He used that against him. Like, why is this worth the whatever that phrase is? Um, so I think they were all getting at that. And so I think you guys did an effective job, you Amicus brief authors, who are urging the court to step back from um, Fossil's position, which is there's a rigid standard, and that is willfulness. Without willfulness, we don't talk about. Uh, profits. Um, and I predict 
that that's where the court will go, that the court will find some middle ground. I think there, there was just such a huge separation between the parties. Um, the lawyer for the, the plaintiff petitioner of Romag suggested that they would get zero, they would get nothing, right? And, and how could trademark law work where an injured, and this is, you know, um, what, what David was saying, you know, how, how could this law really work if we have plaintiffs who are successful and cannot get any relief? You know, this just isn't working. And then on the other side, we have um, lawyer for Fossil saying 200 years of absolutely consistent application of a very strict um, and clear rule. And we need that rule. Otherwise, we're going to have these windfall awards that, that, that aren't just as well. And I think the court is going to reject both of those possibilities. And the court is going to find some space in the middle that, you know, and, and Gorsuch's question was something about will is he said to Neil Kutchell, isn't your strongest argument that willful is just uh, willfulness is just in the air in trademark yeah, in law? The air, yeah. In the air, <laughs> and that is, we don't have to pin it down and find it and give it a, a, a particular definition. Um, Justice Sotomayor kept coming back to, what, what do you mean by willfulness? Doesn't it mean this? Doesn't it mean right. this? Isn't it? Isn't it right. really not so clear? And mm -hmm. so I think all of them were trying to find this space in the middle where there's got to be some equitable principle that's going to not give windfalls, but to give just awards and, and how to find that. Um, and so I think it would be very interesting for us to think about well, what's the policy implication of that middle space? Um, is there a good reason why there should be a willfulness standard? Like what, what, what would that do? What, what would change? I, I don't think the justices had any idea that this was going to matter. Right. So Neil Kutchell suggested one, which is it's a big deal to have to talk about our profits. It's a big deal to have to release all the information for our profits and then have to justify those profits and say that they're not attributable to the infringement. That's a big deal. Like I, we would very much not like to go there. You know, that's a big threshold. And there's still. Um, uh, Fossil argued in the briefs and in the argument today, there's still a lot of, a lot of possibility to do equitable uh, and discretionary things in terms of an award without going to profits. So, so the, the suggestion by Fossil is that there is a, um, you know, there's a, a two-layered approach to these awards. The first is, you know, um, profits or no profits, but the second equitable approach is, generally speaking, the discretion and the equities. Yeah, I, I think that it, it it's a bit presumptuous to assume that every judge is going to bifurcate discovery to allow you know liability. I'm saying for for uh, for Fossil's position is, is is a bit presumptuous. The idea that judges will either entertain an early summary judgment motion and rule on it on the issue of willfulness to get willfulness out of the case at a, an extremely early stage of the case or if, if willfulness stays in, bifurcate discovery uh, to allow, you know, merits discovery first and then damages and profits discovery later. Certainly courts can do that, uh, but I think a lot of judges aren't inclined to do it because it stretches out the case. But that, but this all goes to what Fossil's argument is, right? That, that if a plaintiff, if a, if a defendant thinks that the plaintiff might be able to get uh, recover all their profits without proving willfulness, then a, def a defendant is going to be much more likely to settle and, and settle mm -hmm. for a, a pretty large amount or a larger amount than they otherwise might. Um, because in another case, they might just say, well, well, we'll just stop doing what we're doing, but we're not going to give you any money because we were innocent or we were not willful. Uh, but here, the, con the main concern is this is going to drive up the cost of litigation uh, by, by, you know, having cases go all the way through to the end because of the, the possibility of a profit recovery, or it's going to cause defendants to, to settle early and for more than they want to because of the threat of a windfall. Now, Judge, Justice Breyer kind of was, was getting at this in, 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 in a sense, <coughs> um, focusing on the sentence in, in, in later on in, in the section, saying that you know if a court thinks that the 
profits are too high or too low, the court can has discretion, according to the circumstances of the case, to adjust them. But I think that Fossil's view is that's too little, too late, because now you're you're already at the point where they've they've disclosed all their profits, they've argued about you know whether profits should be awarded, and now you're just kind of tinkering at the end uh, for an adjustment, and, and that's that's not good enough for them. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline, I mean, any any favorite questions? Any 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 judge questions you thought were, were particularly interesting today? Well, I thought the I I thought Justice Kagan's questions about you know what do we think about a presumption of, of willfulness? Mm -hmm. You know, how does that play out? I thought that that was an in, an interesting question. I mean, I, I mean, the justices really did move move sort of to to the middle ground. Um, the thing that I think struck me was that if you're looking at this from the perspective of protecting the consumer, I mean, really, it's if you're not going to be able to get a preliminary injunction, and the standard has changed somewhat, then without something there, you know, some something there, some threat, you know, really, people are sort of those parties are kind of play acting. Because if you don't have, in, in terms of, if you don't have any sense that there could be some kind of culpable, that culpable behavior of some sort, that, that recklessness or willfulness could create um, a means for a disgorgement of profits, then, you know, what do you have there? Uh, because, I mean, this is a specific situation where Fossil, you know, they, um, I'm assuming are not selling counterfeit products. It's a it's a counterfeiting situation to a certain extent, but you've got a different layer because you've got a counterfeiter who really can't be held accountable in a U.S. court. You know, and that you you have you're going to have in any situation where you have um, manufacturing in, in China, you're not going to get a judgment. Um, and, and you'll have that in, and I mean, that's pretty much the way a lot of business operates. So this is a very specific situation. But if you're going to hold a standard, you know, what the court's grappling with is not just a specific situation. So there are going to be situations where there is, you know, a viable trademark infringement claim, but it isn't a counterfeiting claim. You know, it's, it's a simple likelihood of confusion claim. So how does, how will that operate? Where you know there may be, there could be some degree of culpability that's short of willfulness, but but the case has gone so far out, and the plaintiff, a winning plaintiff, you know, has a has a nice judgment on paper, but they've gone through this whole process and they've lost really their rights to their mark. You know, I mean, it's I mean, if you if you counsel small clients and you're counseling them. Well, you know, we can fight this battle. It's a good fight. But at the end of the day, you know, do you want to fight that fight? And are you damaging your own mark? And what's going to ultimately happen? You know, I mean, uh, so it's not, this is a particular situation and it raises a lot of other issues. And in fact, Romag framed this as a counterfeiting case, but there are there, but there are other things. If this were a counterfeiting case, and Romac could go after the factory and felt that that was something that they could have done, um, and and that they could um, be made whole that way, that would be a different scenario. Um, what the but what the court's grappling with isn't isn't that kind of situation really. It just so happens that these facts are unusual facts. Um, yeah, I was just thinking whether they are though, right, or whether this is really <coughs> the modern state where all the manufacturing and decisions are actually done out of country, and, but the litigation has to be done. In country. Well, and and as somebody who's worked both in house <coughs> and at a firm and at, at a major retailer, you know, you've got lots of layers, mm -hmm. and and there are often times, and and when I look at this, I look at who has the risk. Who should bear the risk? Does the um, you know does the U.S. manufacturer who's outsourced what's their risk? Should they should they have should there have been more money placed on on tracking that? Should they have policed it, or or is the risk with fossil? Or you know I mean what what's behind the scenes there? Uh, but you know but this isn't it, it's I thought that. Romag's counsel, and it's understandable, conflating sort of the, the, the counterfeiting sections of the statute, which 
you know, are quite different and, and no one wants a counterfeit product. Um, or, well, I guess no. <laughs> but, <laughs> <Not true. laughs> but, you know, so um, with, with another, you know, something that's a more garden variety trademark infringement case where you may have two businesses that have, you know, I think the, what came up, I think in one of the last questions is why is this different? than a copyright case or a patent case. And it is different for those reasons. It's different because of the sort of the competitive business nature of it, which not, isn't necessarily true uh, or does not need to be true. Well, one thing that, that uh, uh, Neil Katyal didn't say is that there's, a, there's also a constitutional difference, right? Copyrights right. and patents are, are, are directly provided for monopolies in the Constitution, whereas Trademark legislation is comes under the Commerce Clause, under the general power of Congress to, to regulate business. But I, I think that the, they gave a little bit too much, uh, or Neil Cottiel's position or Fossil's position gives a little bit too much credit to only one of the aims of trademark law to protect consumers, right. because there, it's very <clears throat> clear going back to you know going back to 19th century case law that another uh, basis for trademark law is to protect the trademark owner, right. the, the, the person who is of patent law and copyright law and trademark law, is that in copyright and patent law, there, there is no requirement whatsoever to prove willfulness before getting profits. It's if you, if you, prove, the, you, you, you prove infringement, you get the other side's profits attributable to attribute faith or was innocent, therefore they should not have to turn over their profits, or uh, this, this, pers this defendant acted with you know fraudulent intent and therefore should turn over their profits, but the, several of the justices focused on. But you know what about everything in between? What about recklessness? What about callous disregard? And this this kind of comes comes into play, especially in this outsourced manufacturing context. You know what level of we, we expect uh, people who outsource now, companies who outsource to do to to make sure that they're not using sweatshops and make sure that they're you know, uh, uh, not uh, you know violating the F uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and not you know hiring uh, ma manufacturers who bribe and who do all sorts of other illegal things. Should we also expect them to uh, to to be more vigilant about the supply chain and make sure that the components that bear other trademarks that are going into their goods uh, that those components are legitimate? Yeah, in a macro perspective, I think that the position advocated by Fossil is just so far on kind of one side that puts so much of the risk on the, the perhaps the small company or the, the rights, the mark holder. Um, it, it's interesting to me that several of the um, IP organizations that submitted uh, amicus briefs took the kind of middle ground position that, that uh, we came to independently. So INTA, ABA, and, uh, and EIPLA all submitted briefs that basically took more of this middle ground. There was an, an IPO brief and a, a law professor brief from a different perspective. But the folks that, those entities that represent plaintiffs and defendants that, that are helping people in both situations, I mean, I, I'm in the Eighth Circuit where we have the this kind of harsh, from this perspective, stronger rule. And if I'm defending a case, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's better in that particular case um, because it, it, it it helps, uh, you know, someone accused of infringement so much. But I think when you think about it more more broadly, if you're trying to achieve all those purposes that we have in the law, and you're trying to both balance um, the needs for plaintiffs to be able to protect their rights and to be able to have some kind of remedy if the equities uh, make sense, um, versus some of the concerns that a fossil or companies like that have, uh, that they'll be held up and there'll be you know demands for larger settlements. Um, I mean, I, I understand those, but it'll depend on what the facts are. If, if they really were uh, in those situations acting uh, innocently, if they hadn't had problems in their supply chain like here in the past, if they hadn't had reasons that a jury would find they acted in callous disregard, right? those things are all going to help them in those cases, and you just have to try those issues or work them out the way we do any other cases. So I kind of feel like um, these cases all kind of get around that sort of larger question of how you balance the... Um, the different kind of perspectives on that. I also thought basically that it's interesting. I think the questions from the justices, I also found, I think the same ones we're all talking about to be the most interesting. And some of the variants that I thought were most interesting were where they were really questioning if we're all really talking about the same thing in willfulness. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. is, are some of these about reckless disregard and some of them are about just being reckless and some are about a willfulness standard and 
is there really a settled standard? So it's a different way of looking at whether there really is this 200 years of absolute clarity. Uh, and even if we called it willfulness, are we really talking about other things? And if the justices think that's true, then I think they are likely to look for some kind of middle, middle ground. And what uh, Neil Katchel kept saying is, no, willfulness mm -hmm. has always been interpreted to include, it, there may be some variations, but it's mm -hmm. always been interpreted to include uh, knowledge. There's always been some element of knowledge. Mm -hmm. That is consistent. Um, and yet, you know, just looking at where willfulness appears in the statute, I'm looking at the dilution section, and it talks about willful intention. Um, and, and we've been talking about that as the willfulness standard, so there, there's some variation. I wanted to just um, pick up a little bit on, on what you all have been saying about you know the the standards and where the you know where the um, burden should lie in this complicated global um, manufacturing marketing retail space that we inhabit today. And just say that in this particular case, even though this was a small family owned um, uh, plaintiff, um, this uh, plaintiff says that their uh, the manufacturing company in China they refer to as part of the family, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that they had such a close relationship and considered them part of the family um, that they were in very close contact with them, even though they were on the other side of the world. They were in very close contact with them. I don't think it was the largest operation in the world. I think it was easy for them to be in contact. Um, the CEO or the founder of the plaintiff had received emails from an employee at that manufacturing company. And in fact, what those emails said was that there were employees at that manufacturing company who left the company and went to another manufacturing company in China, and that's where the counterfeiting occurred. So that was all kind of, you know, local knowledge. Um, and on that information and on the information of the uh, counterfeits in the stores that the founder himself found and other members of his family found, never did they contact... Um, uh, fossil and say, hey, what's up with this, right? Um, the contract that they had with Fossil said that Fossil had to get the Romag fasteners from that one manufacturing plant in uh, China and who Fossil contracted with, that was a, a, a contractual obligation with them, and they went to another firm. So, I mean, this wasn't, this wasn't so hard to find the problem and where it existed and all that. So it, it may be in another case, this would be terribly difficult, but in this case, I don't think it was. I think those are some of the equities that really hurt the plaintiff uh, at trial, mm -hmm. where um, one of the things that got overruled um, was a latches question in, uh, in the patent case, and I don't, the details of that don't matter, but I think what does matter is that the judge was clearly troubled that they had waited so long, that this was pretty clear to them, that they knew about it sooner, and in fact, I think there's maybe even some sort of a sanction awarded um, based on the fact that they knew for six months or so, later claimed that they had known and had this epiphany shortly before the Thanksgiving holiday when they thought they had the strongest leverage to, to move forward. And so those are some of the, the equitable factors that, you know, again, should be relevant, um, will be relevant if the case, you know, goes back. Um, I think you're right, it's a little more clear in this one. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you all um, to conclude by uh, predicting what the holding is going to be and how many judges can be on each side. Uh, I think the holding is going to be, and, and this isn't just because we, we advocated it at, at, at the INTA, <laughs> but I think the holding is going to be that willfulness is an important factor, but one of many factors that uh, court should, should decide, that in some cases it might be determinative alone, but that it is not a threshold factor for awarding profits. I think that it's it's probably going to come down. Uh, it's impossible to tell where, where Justice Thomas is going to come down, but I think it'll probably be around 6-3 or 7-2. Uh, one thing that we didn't mention is that Justice Thomas is not speaking up was particularly significant in this case because one of the cases that um, Fossil cited in its brief was a DC Circuit case that Justice Thomas had authored where that went into some detail in explaining why uh, why profit should not be awarded in the absence of willfulness. Mm -hmm. So his silence was was, you know, it's uh, it's really intriguing in this in this particular case. Jacqueline? Well I you know I'm not going to say who's what the decision, but I agree it, there's going to be well 
um, that that willfulness is, is is important, but not that profits. It, it can't be a gatekeeper. That that it can be a significant. Um, it can be significant that, that a presumption may be, in fact, or something close to a presumption may be um, necessary, uh, but it, it can't be the sole gatekeeper, and that there are, under certain facts, culp other, other forms of culpability, other uh, either um, callousness or, or, um, or reckless, a recklessness standard. But I think you would have to have something like that. It couldn't just be... Um, this isn't a strict liability situation. So, like recklessness, like a, a big company with, with the means doesn't do a trademark search and just blasts into the market with a, with a trademark. Well, I don't think a, I don't think that a, that that, that I think the, a recklessness standard would have to be have a different factual basis than simply whether or not you do a trademark search because you and I can do the same trademark search and we can come out differently on it. Yeah, and it would you know, be and and I don't think that, and, and just because we're on opposite sides or we're on this whatever, and one of us wins and one of us loses, doesn't mean that either one of us, I think, has our opinions reckless. I think there's so many factors that you look at. So no, I, I was saying, I was saying, not doing a search at all. In other words, there's some case, there's some cases saying that where someone has the means to, to, oh, to, to, do a to, trademark to commission search. a trademark search and doesn't bother, that that act of not doing the search itself is reckless. That, that they're just going out into the market and, and that, that, that that is not, maybe not quite willful, but is, is reckless, depending on the circumstances. Yeah, and even that would depend on the circumstances because some markets, you know who's in the market. Right. You know, I mean, how many of us have yeah. seen this situation where a client comes to us, they ask for a trademark search, they know that there's somebody in the market that they have, you know, and, and that doesn't even come up on the trademark search. You're using a third-party vendor and you know, and it doesn't come up, but they know about these folks, or that there's some backstory, and they haven't told you about the backstory, mm -hmm. but you, but they feel like, oh, we have this trademark search, and like our outside counsel told us we're fine, but there's other things. So I think a trademark search is valuable, but also there are there are situations where companies just don't do trademark searches yeah. for various reasons, and it doesn't have to do with the fact that they. Um, intend to be willful infringers or reckless infringers. It's just they know who's in their market. They're using a mark in a certain way. You know, it's um, they're extremely cheap and don't want to. <laughs> but there are a lot of other reasons for for not doing one that. Yeah. Dean, write yes. your, write your mm -hmm. opinion. This shows we're going to have plenty of litigation to have over. <laughs> what whatever uh -huh. the standard might be. Um, I actually, uh, I think I agree. Uh, I do think they're probably going to. I'm concerned that I'm. Uh, seeing that too much through sure. the advocacy position a little bit, although an amicus brief is different. I, I think they are most likely to uh, reject the the absolute uh, requirement of willfulness. But there are a couple of the justices whose questions uh, and the Justice Th then Judge Thomas opinion and some others out there that uh, I think it might be a little closer. But I, I think I think it'll be a um, I think it will kind of steer that kind of middle ground. Would you vote for the a presumption idea if you were on the court and Kagan wrote the opinion? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. I would. I think it's better and it's more consistent with everything that many many of the entities argued and others uh, that you that, that courts can figure out what these principles of equity are. And adding a presumption almost creates a problem the other way. It almost uh, ratchets it up unnecessarily, kind of in the same way that this willfulness requirement does. So I would not, uh, I don't think, I hadn't thought about that before today, but I think I'd, I think I'd go no on the presumption. Uh, but my prediction would be, but it's not a super strong one, but is it, I'll go that way. Christine, take, take us out. Tell us the truth. It's going to be very disappointing. <laughs> I, my prediction is that the court will reject the argument that uh, Romag made that the 1999 amendment, um, uh, you know, withdraws any willful, you know, changes the standard. Uh -huh. um, but they will also reject Fossil's position that willfulness is absolutely required to talk about profits. Right. And that anything they say beyond that will not be very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with that final note, I think we'll take us out. So thank you to all our panelists for coming. Thank you to our audience for taking part. And if there's a Supreme Court case involving an IP issue, we will be here on the evening 
uh, of the argument with panelists discussing what the court meant. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> like <laughs> Everything good. Yeah. How are you? Absolutely. Hanging in there. Me too. Yeah. Oh, ready. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Oh, God. Yeah. 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 Yeah.